Okay, so this is our summary lecture for abdominal hysterectomy. Some of the terminology and indications. So there's three main ways to do hysterectomy. Abdominal, which is what we're talking about now, and this is the most common. Uh, vaginal, which is fairly rare. I only saw one or two of those, and then laparoscopic, which was actually fairly common. I saw quite a few of those. So total hysterectomy versus supracervical. The point to make here is that total doesn't have anything to do with whether you're taking out the tubes and ovaries or not. Total means that you're removing um, the entire the entire uterus, including the cervix, whereas supracervical means that you're um, cutting above the cervix, leaving part of the cervix in. So if you want to if you want to note that you're taking out the tubes and ovaries, you refer to that as like this. So that'd be a t total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo uuphrectomy. So indications for this procedure, the the top the top ones are uterine leiomyoma. That's the most common. So what's an alternative to hysterectomy for that? Can you think of any? I can think of two. There's one is uterine artery embolization. Another one is myomectomy. Uh, pelvic organ prolapse. What's an alternative? Um, you could use a pessary or pelvic floor strength in the exercises. A pelvic pain or infection. It depends what's causing it, but let's say the, pel the pelvic pain is caused by endometriosis. What would be an alternative to surgery for that? You could use a GnRH analog. Bleeding. You could try endo endometrial ablation. Uh, and for malignancy, uh, things depending on the grade and things like that, coinization or something less um, serious than a hysterectomy could be tried. So the pre-op setup is the standard setup that, that we've been seeing for these type of operations. So use cephalosporin, I mean a cephalosporin as uh, the antibiotic. You put in a Foley because you want to decompress the bladder, make it make it smaller so you're less likely to injure it and that also um, makes it less distended so the detrusor muscle on the wall is thicker so it's harder even if you do touch it or hit it a little bit it's harder to actually damage it. Um, ET intubation in general. Stents, I never saw these used but apparently you can put stents in the ureters if you're really worried about not being able to, to see them well. DVT prophylaxis, so you use the um, compression devices on the calves and, and in heparin. Cancer evaluation you need, you need to make sure that the person's up to date with that, and specifically you want to make sure they've had a pap smear within the last three months um, before the operation, and if they're, depending on their age, a mammogram. If, if there's things to indicate that you might be worried about endometrial cancer, you want to make sure that's followed up before the operation. So for example, let's say there's a 35-year-old woman with um, sort of abnormal vaginal bleeding. You'd want to, you'd want to make sure that uh, you checked out the endometrial lining, and how could you, how could you check that out? You could do a DNC and see what it looks like. You could also do targeted endometrial biopsies. So once um, you've done this pre-op stuff, then the pa you put the patient in supine and stirrups, and you're ready to go with the, the operation. So to start our anatomy review, uh, the main thing that I want to show here is just the peritoneum. So it comes here over the uterus, reflects up onto the bladder, and makes this um, vesico-uterine fold. So that's the reflection of the peritoneum here. And posterior, we have the, the cul-de-sac, pouch of Douglas, um, the bladder, anterior, rectum, rectum in the back. So here's the vaginal opening coming to the cervix and the uterus, making about a 90 degree angle. So before the, the operation starts, you might be asked to do a bimanual examination. And I'll just put this here. So this is the transformation of this angle over to this side. So that's the vaginal opening cervix, uterus, making the angle here. So you, when you do this exam, you're checking out the position of the uterus, so where is it? Then you also feel the um, adenexa. So for the uterus, the first thing you want to note is the version. So that's the relationship of the uterus with respect to the, the vaginal opening. So you push on the cervix here, and you're feeling in the abdomen. So if you can feel the uterus, then it's probably antiverted, like shown. If you can't feel anything, then it could be retroverted. So that would be pointing back like this. So when you're pushing up on it, you can't feel it. Flexion refers to the relationship of the uterus with respect to the cervix. So let's say the uterus is shaped like this. So that would be antiverted and also antiflexed. Inversion seems to be the most important. So if you if you can feel it in the abdomen, then it's probably antiverted. If you can't, then it might be it might be retroverted or maybe it's just too small for you to feel it. As far as the adenex to go and feeling the ovaries I really could never feel the ovaries, and I think it's hard to do. I, I mean, if you can't feel anything, that's okay. Just say, you know, I don't, I, don't, I couldn't feel it. So more um, along the anatomy review lines. So you have the abdominal aorta coming down, divides up into common iliacs, 
common iliacs further divide into external and internal. What does the external become? It becomes femoral after the inguinal ligament. The internal divides up into anterior and posterior divisions. So for us, what's important is the anterior division because that gives off the uterine, also the va vaginal artery, the umbilical artery, and some others. And so here's the uterus. Okay. So the next thing, important thing to note is the path of the ureter. So the ureter is coming down from the kidney. It passes above the common iliacs right here by the bifurcation into the external and the internal. It comes down and passes beneath the uterine artery. So that's where the water under the bridge comes from that you learned about in, in year one anatomy. So water under the bridge is down here, the ureter passing underneath the uterine artery. Um, but above here, it's the ureter actually passes above the blood supply. It goes on top of the um, common iliacs. So embryology and lymphatics, they kind of go together. So the uterus and the upper part of the vagina, what, what do they come from? They come from malarian. They're malarian structures. So where do the where do they drain? They drain to the internal and external iliacs, and ultimately uh, the common iliac. That's where that those are the lymphatic that's those are the lymph nodes that drain um, the uterus and the upper vagina. The distal vagina, the lower vagina, has a different origin. It comes from the urogenital sinus. So where does that drain to? That drains over here to the inguinal. The inguinal is by the femoral artery. So we'll just put the over, an ovary over here. I think we know the blood supply to that and the lymphatic drainage fairly well. The blood supply comes off the abdominal aorta and the lymphatics are paraaortic. So moving on to the final uh, layer of anatomy to add, and that's the ligaments. So we've already talked about um, some of this indirectly. So the ovarian artery traveling from the abdominal aorta, it goes, it goes in a ligament called the suspensory ligament of the ovary, at least that's the way it was referred to as in year one and two, but on the, the rotation it was referred to as infundibulopelvic ligament. So the IP ligament, so that's the IP, carries the blood supply to the ovaries. Um, next is the blood supply to the uterus, and that's coming in the cardinal ligament. And where does the uterine artery come from? It comes from the anterior branch of the internal iliac artery. So next we'll add the uterosacral ligament which comes here and sort of merges up with the cardinal ligament form, forming the uterosacral complex which attaches to the side of the uterus and cervix here. There's also the round ligament which is a remnant of the gubernaculum. It's headed over to the labia majora. Inside of it is Samson's artery. And then we have uh, the final ligament to talk about is, is nice because the way it's named is the utero-ovarian ligament connecting the uterus and the ovary. So for the procedure itself, um, you start off by making an abdominal incision. So you do it typically a transverse incision in the abdomen. Then you open that up using retractors. You can use self-retractors, and if you're around, you're the, you'll probably be the, doing the retraction yourself. And when you put the retractors in, it can remind you to think about some of the, the nerves in the area. So there's the lumbosacral plexus. The main important nerve coming from the lumbo part of that is the femoral nerve. And there's another nerve that's important. That's called the genitofemoral nerve. That's L1 and L2. And that's important because it goes right on top of the psoas muscle. And you're putting um, the retractor in. If it's too deep, um, it can actually hit that nerve. So if you hit the genital femoral nerve, um, the damage that can be caused from injuring it is anesthesia to the medial part of the thigh and the lateral part of the labium. Another nerve um, in this area, which can be damaged by retractors if they go lateral to the psoas, but more commonly is just um, compressed by the way the patient's positioned, if you sort of over flex the hip, you can compress a nerve called the femoral cutaneous nerve, which is L2 and L3. So if you um, compress or damage that nerve, that causes anesthesia to the um, anterior part of the thigh. So now you've made the incision, you've looked around, the first things you're going to do is grab the uterus with Kocher clamps here. And this area where you're grabbing is called the cornu of the uterus, sort of the area near where the fallopian tubes insert. So you grab that with clamps. Above the cornu are, is the fundus, and below is the body. And the, the first real step of the procedure, after you've after you've sort of got everything set up and looked around, is dividing the round ligament. So if you're asked what are what is this or what am I doing, and it's the first time you see you see um, a lot of activity like cutting something, it looks like a ligament. That's probably the round. That'd be the the safe bet there. And then when you're looking. In, 
in the abdominal cavity and you see something white, that's probably the ovary. That's the only real white thing in the abdominal cavity, whether it's big or small, or you think it looks like an ovary, you think it's weird looking, and that's probably what it is. So once you cut the round, then you have to, um, you can go one of two ways, depending if you're taking the ovaries with you or if you're leaving them. So let's say you're taking the ovaries. We'll draw the blood supply to the ovary, which we know that comes from the abdominal aorta and travels in the infundibulo pelvic ligament. So let's say we're going to take the ovaries with us. We have to extend this incision in the peritoneum laterally over to the over to the IP, infundibulo pelvic, and we have to cut and ligate that. Now let's say we're going to leave the ovaries um, inside. So what are we going to do if we do that? We're going to make a little hole in the peritoneum. We're going to see the utero ovarian ligament in the tubes. And we're going to grab those and divide those. So now we've dealt with the ovaries and we can start to work our way down. So we can cut the peritoneum off the side of the uterus as we go down. And remember that we have the bladder here, anterior uh, to the uterus. And so there's the peritoneum surrounding the entire uterus reflecting up onto the bladder. So to help get the bladder out of the way, you can cut this peritoneum making a bladder flap, push the bladder down out of the way. So now you've worked your way down, you got the bladder out of the way, what are you going to run into down here? We're going to run into the blood supply for the uterus, which is coming in the cardinal ligament. That's the uterine artery. And you're also going to see the utero sacral ligament coming here. And remember that we have the ureter going underneath, that's the water, water under the bridge. So now that we're down here, we can, we can um, cut, clamp, and, and ligate these arteries to get them off the uterus. So we've got the uterus disconnected from, um, from its blood supply and from the peritoneum, and the only thing left to deal with is the connection between um, the cervix and the vagina here. So you can put in something like it looks like a plastic cup to help better sort of visualize what you're doing, and then you need to um, cut the cervix off the vagina. So you can do that with a knife, or you can do that with electrocautery, but either way, you, you, you remove it, and then you have to make what's called a vaginal cuff, which you make by running absorbable sutures through the vagina here, closing off the cuff. And now you've disconnected the uterus, so you can remove it. And then check for hemostasis, so your two main vascular pedicles would be here. One, that's the IP with the blood supply to the ovaries, and then two, um, your blood supply to the uterus, make sure that there's no bleeding, and also check to make sure there's no bleeding on the cuff. Um, you have the you take the uterus out through the incision, the incision you made in the abdomen, and then you close, and you're um, done with the procedure. So, complications are things that that you should that you could watch out for. So the most common is fever. So what's fever in a post-op patient? That's a temperature greater than 38 or 100.4. You, well, you want to see that measured twice. So let's say you have a person with a fever. What are you going to do? You're going to go evaluate them, and you're going to look. You're going to look at the five W's. Try to find a focal source of infection. So wind, that's the first W. Atelectasis or pneumonia. Uh, water, it's UTI, wound. So that'd be the abdominal incision. But also important to remember here is it could be the uh, the vaginal cuff. So you'd want to do a pelvic exam, um, see if the cuff looks infected, and check the IV site too. And then walking uh, DVTs, wonder drugs. That'd be drug-induced fever. So let's say you've, you're suspicious of a, of a focal source or you found one, then you want to treat with the, start treating with a single agent like piperacillin or cefoxifen. If there's sepsis, then you move on to a multi-agent treatment like an aminoglycoside uh, with an an something that provides the anaerobic coverage. So the anaerobic coverage comes from clindamycin or metro. Hemorrhage, uh, bladder, ureter injury. Uh, we've talked about that and how to avoid it. So when is that most common? It's most common when you're cutting the cardinals. Um, but it could also occur when you're cutting the IP. Uh, bowel injury, cuff tissue, that's the, the cuff sewing the vagina shell like we talked about at the end. So if that comes open a little bit and some bowel comes out and, and gets strangulated, it loses its blood supply. Um, that's a serious, um, sort of rare and unique complication to this type of operation. And there's a the general surgical stuff like MI or stroke. So post-op, you have a standard post-op setup. Don't eat antibiotics after the first day. You keep the foley in for a day, some fluids, DVT prophylaxis, ambulate, ambulate quickly, and advance the diet. So questions that um, you might get asked or that you could ask. So there's the what's in type question. So what's in the round? Samson's. You could all say, what is the round? Is it remnant of the gubernaculum? Where's the round going? The labium majorum. Uh, what's in the IP? 
ovarian vessels, what's in the cardinal uterine vessels, where does the ovarian come from, Domino aorta, where does the uterine artery come from, well that comes from the internal iliac, the anterior division. Now let's say you have, um, you don't notice any damage to, a ur to the ureter when you're doing the procedure right after, but a couple days later um, you do. What could that be caused by? Well that could be caused by heat. So let's say you're using electrocautery near the ureter and the, the, um, the heat extends over to involve the ureter, it causes inflammation and then a couple days later the ureter um, scars off, so that could be a delayed cause of injury. Um, another thing actually to mention, we can go back here, is let's say you're leaving the ovaries in. Okay, so what, what cuts would you make? We'd cut the round, we're keeping the ovaries, so we're utero-ovarian and the fallopian, so we'll cut these too. And so now you have the ovaries just hanging hanging out here, so they've sort of lost their support, they've lost what, what they've been tethered to, so you can have torsion, so a way you can avoid torsion where the ovary flips on itself and cuts off its blood supply is you can anchor the ovary to the um, stub of the, of the round ligament that's left. Okay, and so to wrap it up, um, the indications, you know the when you look through the chart for the operation, you can see wh why the person's having it. The operation, cancer, pelvic organ prolapse, lyomyoma. Um, questions that you could ask during the procedure, you could ask about um, what the person thinks about deciding between a vaginal or abdominal approach. For example, the, the size of the uterus or nulliparity, would, that, would those factors favor the abdominal approach for the person you're working with? And also supracervical versus total. There's historically been controversy about whether um, supracervical is better for preserving sexual function and preventing um, like vault prolapse. Uh, studies haven't really bared that out, but you can see if uh, the person you're working with you know, leans, leans towards thinking that's true or they don't. Or they don't. And then GN GNRH analogs, you can see if, it, if um, you've seen them used to reduce the size of the uterus um, to allow a transverse incision. So that wraps up the summary of abdominal hysterectomy.